initiatives and the European Green Deal Ecolise Policy Stakeholder uh, event, quite a long title. Welcome colleagues here in the room and welcome um, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen in your office on the screen or at home on the screen, wherever you are. I see we have quite a lot of participants here. Happy to welcome you to this to this uh, today's meeting. I'm going to start at first with the technical um, uh, issues, the language regime. We can speak, listen, and listen in English, uh, Spanish, uh, and French. Um, this meeting is web streamed, so be careful what you say. And before you take the floor, please. Be sure that the hairs are okay. For me, it's fine. I don't have to care about this uh, um, on it. Um, and um, we have the opportunity or the possibility to, to take questions, but this is what I'm going to tell you. Normally, I would now hand over to my co-moderator, but we have still a couple of technical problems. That's why I used the opportunity uh, to start already with my part, and uh, in meanwhile, we try to we try to to solve and to fix the problem uh, with Mickey. Um, I hope that this uh, this this will run. So my name is Peter Schmidt. I'm the current uh, president of the so-called NAT section. This is one of out of six sections in this in this committee in the European Economic and Social Committee. And for years, we organize uh, together with, with Ecolise. Uh, this event. So I had the opportunity uh, over the last years to open this event several times, to join this event several times, and we had uh, mostly in this room um, always very, very fruitful debates. And um, from my point of view, Ecolis is a very important uh, uh, organization because we think when it comes to Green Deal, and that's to today's, uh, today's subject, what we are talking about, when it comes to Green Deal, then we must count on the local level. We must count on the implementation, and now it's time for implementation. And um, last week, when two weeks ago, when we were in Egypt, um, uh, Executive Vice President Franz Timmermans announced, uh, that's why I'm happy that we have uh, here today with us Daniel Mees from the, from the Cabinet, um, he announced good news that the measures taken are probably on the way for 57% on uh, greenhouse gas um, emission reduction, which are good news. Um, so that's why the most important point is that we talk with people living on the ground. And as we know, the, the, the success factor of the implementation and the climate change is uh, are the citizens. Um, the one is the policy frame, but the other one are the citizens. And we see this over the years, that these bottom-up movements, that people are installing, for instance, solar panels on their roofs by their own investment, or whatever we have, uh, also farmers, um, business, and, um, and all society groups are working now on this. And the key element are the municipalities. So that's why we are really happy to, to work with you on this, uh, on, this, on this subject. And we, as civil society, have a lot of wishes. I could table now all our opinions which we made in the last years. We made leaving no one behind, for instance. We made a lot of other issues or opinions on energy production, on citizens' involvement. But one wish is for us a key element and an important one. Uh, that means civil society contribution. So saying that we have uh, a key element means that the citizens are going to implement, means at the same time that politicians must involve civil society when they have the policy making process and this implementation process. That's for us a key, a key element and for this we have called for a lot of things um, for instance uh, looking at uh, Josep uh, Piroshka and uh, Lydia here in the room, they were the, the, uh, are the drivers in our NAT section when it comes to the question of rural development. We say we must have a holistic approach in the rural development and we must have a concept and a plan how we can involve people, how we can uh, foster um, the development in rural areas to keep people uh, in these areas, to bring jobs into these areas. So we have described quite, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, papers on it. Another example is our, <clears throat> our um, European uh, um, Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. We launched it 
2016 together with the Commission, and we can say today this is a success factor. This is one of the success factors in the transition process to a circular economy, and we see how active this platform is, and on an annual basis and on on you can almost say on a daily basis, there are so many activities uh, which has grown. We see that in the ESC that we have so many activities and the Secretariat is quite active and has to manage it, which is not easy, uh, also in terms of, in, in terms of uh, resources. So I'm looking now uh, to my colleagues uh, whether I should bridge longer or not, um, whether we have, uh, whether we have um, uh, the colleagues. So let me thank... So it doesn't work? We will, try. we will try. So let me thank, before I hand over to Miki, if Miki is not able to join, then Nina will take it over. So let me really thank Ecolise for your activities and for this long-standing collaboration uh, what we are having over the years. For us, it's an important one because we are civil society and we must be linked uh, to different initiatives, especially to the, to the ground level, and uh, that's why we are happy that we kept this um, liaison uh, with, with you and uh, happy to now invite Mike for her initial statement. So, Mike, can we try it? Press speak button, please. Then you, you should be online. Press the speak button, but just once. Okay, it seems that it doesn't work. Then I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, and we must have a look at the time because Daniel is not that long here. No? So just that we know if you want to have him and ask him some questions, then we should now. Yeah, you have right. the floor, Nina. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'm very sorry that Mike Elsinger could not be here now. Uh, she has connection problems. So I'm the uh, policy lead at Ecolise, and I'll take over uh, saying these welcoming words that Mike also co-prepared. Um, just a, a quick introduction to Ecolise. It's a European Association for Climate uh, and Environment Action by community-led initiatives. So what Peter Schmidt just said about the needed civil society implementation of the European Green Deal is one way of putting it. Um, how we at Ecolise, I think, see it is that there are grassroots initiatives, so there is a lot growing. And the question is rather maybe not only how to implement the European Green Deal, but how to connect what's coming from the EU level with what's growing from the grassroots level. So Ecolise has permaculture, eco-villages and transition network amongst its members, but also, and I think that is very special, academic institutions, and we will have one of them, Georgia Silvestri, today with us from Drift in Rotterdam. There's also the Center for Alternative Technology, Cat Wales, who are amongst the members, and equally local governments for sustainability. So this is what Ecolise is. You can see it on this slide here. And I'm also very happy, and that's on the next slide, to announce that we have, I think it's more than 17 supporting partners of this event. And this shows the big interest in implementation, as we call it in policy speak, which just means, you know, how do we bring these international agreements, as is the European Green Deal, to local levels. And I must say, until now, we don't have a plan, and that's why we're here today. Over to you, Peter. <laughs> that was very, really short. Thank you very much to keep the time, uh, Nina. So let's go directly to you, uh, Daniel. Um, we have uh, an, an, a small panel organized this, uh, with the title How to Activate the Potential of Social Change and um, Community-Led Local Ecological Action Within the Green, Green Deal. My problem on this title is always that we, the ESC, we always said this should be a green and social deal also in the title, not to clarify that without a social deal, there is no green deal because the people won't, uh, won't follow us. So, Daniel, do you have the floor? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Schmidt, and thank you very much also uh, to uh, um, Nina and uh, Ms. Elzegra. I hope that she can join uh, soon. It's always great to, to be here at uh, the European Economic uh, Social Committee. The last time I was here, 
it was at the start of the mandate and actually I started then my intervention by saying uh, there would not have been a Green Deal without uh, civil society to start with uh, because we all know how this climate agenda really got this mega push forward by people just taking the initiative to take to the streets, notably the youth and the, your, your institution is becoming very uh, good at connecting the youth uh, to our work. So civil society was where lots of this was, was, was born and the European Green Deal would not have um, been there without that uh, pressure that uh, the politicians started feeling. But also uh, I take it uh, from you that now in this phase where uh, you see that we, we presented the big package, uh, the Fit 55 package, we can now even call it Fit, Fit 57 package, as you say, uh, because indeed the targets uh, seem to be on the on the right side uh, in 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 that in that package. Uh, but one by one, we're striking the political deals. Uh, we struck the political deal. The first one was on on cars, so that all new car sales must be uh, zero emission in uh, in 2035. Uh, effort sharing, uh, many of these files are now seeing final deals. And it is important to realize that because the activism that, that we all know uh, from on the streets and Greta Thunberg and uh, very important to, 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 to keep everybody alert, especially at the global level as well, that action needs to be taken. But I agree with you that we should not underestimate that we now also need on top of that, an extra form of, of activism, an, uh, an extra form of community-led uh, uh, action, namely to, to indeed implement the Green Deal as, as, we, as it now is taking really final legislative uh, shape in, in terms of binding uh, rules. I think that it, it's also not a, a word that understates the importance of, of community-led uh, action on, on the streets, that, that it's about implementing the Green Deal, because the way that, that many of our rules work is that we set targets. So it, 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 we set targets for, for the renewable energy and in the energy mix, we set targets for energy efficiency that needs to be achieved, but these targets need, yeah, need, need to find their ground on the local level where actually the people really realize what it means. Uh, it's very easy to sit in the Berlemont and, and work on, on a European rule. It's not so easy to actually then go into the street and then say you need to insulate your house and, and uh, do it together with your entire neighborhood. So given the fact that these are targets, this, 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 the, the local action and the, the role of the community in there is extremely important to well get these targets done to make sure that it's also a fair transition, as you also say, uh, that is obviously very important to, to my boss as a socialist um, uh, as well, that, that everybody can come along. And I would even say it's, it's crucial to make sure that you end take climate action and that your city and your region stays a nice place to live in. Uh, because uh, it, it's one thing to work with targets. I think that community-led action is very important to make sure that people have the feeling that the sustainable life in line with this climate agenda could be a nice life uh, to have in a city that is that is nice and i i my my boss feels that inspiration every day when he, when he travels around in uh, europe uh, just a month ago we were in uh, rotterdam which is by coincidence my uh, my hometown where um you had this 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 new uh, project where they had a local farm on top of of of, of a rooftop um something that just was an idea of somebody. Somebody just had the idea, I want to work together with my with my community uh, on that. And that started morphing into far, far more because Rotterdam started thinking about what is the solar roof potential in my city. And then that uh, rooftop said, well, we can start with the sensors uh, to make sure we have the sensors already uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the crops that we build, uh, that, we f that we give the fertilizers uh, at, at the exact same time. And we know that we have to experience how to do it. And these sensors will also become important to see which uh, rooftops uh, are important for, for solar energy potential. And they even had the idea, they looked across the street and they saw this, this, this very long uh, building uh, with, a, with a roof that was now derelict. Uh, and they said that could be a nice green pathway uh, all the way up to uh, up, up the suburbs of Rotterdam. And that will now happen just because somebody had that idea and somebody had a community behind it. So that's important. And then very shortly, uh, three, things how you, uh, three ways how you connect these dots. Uh, it's very good that you have Laurence uh, Graaf uh, later on as well, because he is, uh, of course, very close to Claude de Torre and the Climate Pact Advisor. That's obviously an important uh, uh, way to, uh, to work together uh, on this. The European Climate Pact is intended to work with communities on community-led action to do something that is also in line with the climate targets. Uh, a check like that is, of course, is also important, and DG Klima has that expertise, so she will I guess, give you lots of uh, feedback on that. 
I think it's also to, important to keep on working with not only your institution but also the committee of the regions because you do you do also need people that can help um, the local communities to translate what is happening in this Brussels labyrinth and uh, to help them uh, on their way in in feeding us with uh, with with the input because let's face it it is not always easy to understand the European bingo lingo of of, of different rules and regulations and it's good that an institution like yours can help um, can help the local communities there. And there's one important political point um, that I would like uh, uh, to make. There is a reason why we started with um, missions uh, under uh, under the climate umbrella. Uh, we have this. Uh, we have to introduce the proposed this mission to have 100 climate neutral cities by 2030. We also have a climate adaptation mission, which is at the regional level, because indeed it is important that our rural communities are are part of of our sustainable future, and their challenges are uh, different. Um, these missions are important because we, we, we often see that uh, local communities and their municipalities uh, sometimes can struggle because the national government can be of a different political stripe and there could be all sorts of things going on why a city that has a very good plan can't make that plan uh, happen. And the, the benefit of these missions is that it's, 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 it's a mission that is about a, a direct competition between cities. Cities can just come with their plan to become climate neutral by 2030, for instance. Their plan is then judged on its merits. And based on the objective merits, uh, there could also be uh, European funding made uh, uh, available. And I think that that kind of direct work is, 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 is very, very important. And we will make sure that um, all of this is happening on, a, on an objective uh, basis that we don't have any uh, political games uh, going on because I think that's important also for the communities that are uh, working on uh, on this. So we vigorously uh, check that. We started introducing some uh, some parameters for that uh, already, and we will start. We will do that also when it comes to uh, these uh, uh, these these missions. And I want to finish again that even for that part, the community-led action is is so important because it's one thing for politicians to ignore each other. But it's difficult to ignore entire communities that have votes later on and that really say together, we want to do this. We want to have this bio uh, economy and society. We want to have uh, the, the, the green cities. We want to have the clean mobility, including public transport and cycling. Community-led action is very important to, to make sure that many of the things don't stay stuck in fights between politicians, but you, that you actually really get the pressure to, to get things done. So um, very nice to be here and, and very important, the work that you're doing. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Since we have you here, uh, I would like to, to, to give the opportunity for two questions maximum, if there are questions. So meanwhile, someone is thinking whether they have a question. I, th I was recently in a, in, a, in a village which is very famous in Germany. Uh, it's called Wilpotsried. It's close by, by coincidence, close to my hometown. Um, so they have an energy production on 800%, no? so, including industry. So that means they're able to do it already on renewable energy, only uh, build on this. So is, has anyone a question to, to Daniel? Because Daniel has to leave. Um, Lydia. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to say that very often uh, there is no political will. Before that, there is no understanding of uh, politicians why they should uh, uh, involve community because they are chosen by community to do things. So how we can or you can as politicians uh, influence uh, on all uh, levels of the uh, decision making uh, to politicians that are making decisions that they understood that uh, community-led initiatives are really important. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's of course the crunch uh, question, right? Like uh, for, for, for a session like uh, this, there, there, there are two things that, that I think will really help because you're right, uh, politicians are, uh, are voted in by the same communities that are taking these uh, actions. But if you look at really what is happening with the European Green Deal and these targets that we've set, many of them that have to be reached by, by 2030, uh, any politician, will, a local politician will need a, need a plan for that. And that plan needs to start with uh, communities that, that also tell them what, what, what is feasible. And that's also the way that this mission works for the climate neutral cities. It's based on a, on a, on a plan, a program that each uh, city needs to uh, uh, present to us. And 
to me it seems that any politician is wisely advised to, to check what is going on in the communities to see, you know, how can I match the target that I need to reach by 2030 uh, with the reality um, on the ground. And of course, we need, we need to keep on being inspired uh, by it, uh, also directly in, in Europe, because uh, who knows, new community-led actions can uh, lead to new targets, I think, if, if you see that, uh, they are, uh, that they are feasible. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, of course, that you need to make sure that, that at least from the European level, you do your utmost to make sure that there are belts and, bra belts and braces uh, in place that uh, local politicians, regional politicians, national politicians actually do that in, in, in cooperation with civil society. And that's, for instance, one thing that we also did in the way that um, this big pot of money for the recovery, uh, we're now living in an energy crisis, we almost uh, tend to forget that we, still, we were still recovering from the COVID uh, crisis economically. Next Innovation EU was this, this massive uh, recovery uh, uh, program that everybody has, has, has heard of uh, in, in this room. And one thing that we've introduced there is that in, in the recovery plans that need to be developed, member states need to show that they've involved uh, civil society in, in, a, in a good and comprehensive way. Now, of course, you can't check every single last dot and comma in, in Europe, but you can check whether something manifestly happened in the right way and something manifestly didn't happen uh, in, in the right way. And that is, I think, a model that, that, that will become more and more important. Uh, I follow also in the cabinet of uh, Mr. Timmermans uh, the CARS file that we just concluded and also in the political deal uh, the European Parliament for instance asked like I want to have a provision in there that we have a just transition also in the automotive supply chain with a big change involvement of civil society that demands you see across all these files so at a certain point we will in each of our rules will have that uh, that mindset in any event because people are asking for it and it's in uh, and it's in high demand. Thank you. Lutz, short and then short answer, then give you now, or just two now. I'm, I'm a German environmentalist, being here in the committee for a long time. Uh, and I completely agree with, with uh, that, what you have said, uh, Daniel, but this is not a one-way road. Huh? Uh, it's not just the commission or the politicians on government level or wherever who have good ideas, and it's not just that they need uh, the communities, the cities, the citizens, to implement that, what they have in mind. There are excellent ideas on the ground, and they are not taken up uh, into account by the politicians, so the bottom-up approach. And this is my question. How, how, how do you want to structure this process to learn from bottom-up initiatives? I'll give you a very short example. I have a share in a windmill. I would like to make use of the electricity coming out of that windmill because it's the cheapest electricity you can imagine. I'm not allowed to do it. And, the, and the, uh, the, 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 the commission is speaking about citizens' energy for I do not know how many years. And in the State of the Energy Un Union report, nothing in on, on citizens' energy. So how do you want to structure that learning process from the bottom up? Yeah. Um it is, it is indeed important that, uh, that, that it comes from uh, both ways. The way the way that I started indeed, because like it is a reality that we have these binding targets coming our way. Once this 55 package is, is done, there will be a binding target to have an X percent of renewable energy in the energy mix to make sure that the building stock in your member state is more energy efficient by X percent. So there will have to be a link somehow with, uh, with, with these targets uh, uh, that, 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 that it helps to achieve the target that will ultimately be binding. So it can't be uh, something that is uh, totally um, in abstract of what is coming down, as you say, I, I don't like that always, like because it sounds like uh, you sit aloof and uh, what is coming out of Brussels, like uh, what is transmitted across the continent, um, will have consequences on the ground. And uh, it, ne it needs to be, uh, we need the communities to, 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 help, to help us get us there. But as I said already, that doesn't mean that you don't get inspired by, by, by community-led uh, actions that can even lead to new ways that, uh, that European policy is shaped. We have examples of that, like uh, uh, we will soon produce uh, a carbon, uh, carbon removal um, certification um, uh, scheme. I think that uh, perhaps it even came out, uh, it's coming out even this, this week, I think. So this is really like concrete solutions 
how you make sure that, for instance, uh, uh, wood is, 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 is used in a, in a way that is most durable in, in, in furniture, in, in other, it can even be used in, 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 in batteries, um, and carbon removal, uh, other types of carbon removal that are out there. And many of these ideas are actually coming from the ground. It was not us who uh, thought in the Bellemont, oh, let's, let's make it a good idea to use... Um, uh, wood-based products to replace uh, uh, the anodes and the cathodes that we have in batteries that came from that came from the ground that came from uh, uh, well in this case a big company that worked together with the community the forest owners we want to have a sustainable future and as forest owners uh, we came up with that uh, uh, solution so it has to be indeed two ways um, but um, I, I, I'm just keep on saying the, um, it, you have to also be mindful of the fact that these binding targets will be quite um, intense, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, everything else. So anything that communities can really do to help us achieve it, um, uh, yeah, that would be super. Daniel, one question more from remote. Is that fine for you, yeah. time from the time? So taking crucial point you're raising, local finance systems to, to leader, I guess it was, uh, local finance systems that e effectively emu um, emu emulate local currencies is fundamental to transformation development. That's not the question. The question was here, I guess. Sorry. Yeah, it, it can't if you're going to move here, that's problematic for me. So the question is, does the, e the European Commission also take into account sust sustainable finance as a key leverage for achieving local green <laughs> deals? Sustainable finance means money flows are, go are govern governed by communities, not private uh, actors, to achieve collective sustainable goals. Um, it also means the e European Commission sustainable finance framework can land locally. Can both agendas be combined? Can we share the knowledge we developed uh, in this? Uh, yeah, like uh, um, and, uh, that. That's also like uh, a a good uh, uh, a good uh, uh, question um, because when we talk about like these typical European rules on 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 which finance streams in which type of uh, solution or economic activity is still in line with our climate targets for uh, 2050 to become the first European con uh, the first continent in the world to become climate neutral by then. That's often a show of, of, of big companies, uh, big companies that, that, that produce the renewable energy, big companies that produce uh, these low-carbon uh, wood solutions uh, that I've just, uh, uh, that I just uh, uh, mentioned. But you need to be able to bring that back to uh, the local level. And, and I take a lot of inspiration myself from uh, what is happening in, um, in many Scandinavian uh, uh, communities where um, you, you really see um, on the ground in Finland, uh, for instance, that you, on the one hand you have these big companies that are able to work with this taxonomy and they know what, what type of sustainable finance they can attract, but they have a structured way of, 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 of working together with, with cities and regions who will need these uh, uh, solutions. And they're really talking about, like you know, how you can use uh, uh, sludge uh, to produce uh, to produce energy. They, it, it's really like good good stuff that is that that is there. And what I like about it is that um, you have the communities on the one hand, the cities and the, and the regions that, that can say, well, we need a solution like this. You have the the bigger companies who can work with all the sustainable finance streams uh, on the other hand, and they're interested in you because you're potential clients of their solutions. And the more of you buy the solution, the cheaper that solution can also become because you can join forces. So that is, I think, something that inspires us um, a lot uh, and can really be very beneficial in parallel to all the things that we already have, the regional funds and the cohesion funds. And you know that far better than me uh, how that all uh, uh, works. Uh, I think that this is an element to also um, uh, take inspiration uh, from. Um, it also allows me to, to come back on that energy, uh, en the energy community point because that is an, an important point that, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was made. It's something that we've already wanted for quite some time, that people can really really band together in, in, and produce their own um, renewable energy. And again, Scandinavia is quite inspiring there. Um, in, in Denmark, they've started uh, these experiments that um, towns and regions can decide themselves to co-own an onshore wind farm. I think that everybody knows that onshore wind is the most difficult one to get social ac acceptance for because the value of your house does tend to go down if it's very close to uh, too close to wind farm. And the way, the way that the, the, the Danes have done that is, is quite inspiring, I think, because they said, okay, listen, uh, if you uh, do this and you co-own uh, that wind farm, um, 
you can also decide yourself how you spend that money. So you can make the choice yourself to build a road, to uh, uh, a cycle path, uh, have more public transport, uh, a school, a playground. I think that's also a kind of like quite inspiring because in, in that way you can really convince people in a community-led basis to, 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 to come along to see the merit of investing like something in that together and even and make the balance themselves because people are uh, capable of, of, of doing that perfectly well by themselves and I think that's also like quite an inspiring thing to look at that type of model. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. But I guess we could uh, have a chat with you the, the whole afternoon because we have a lot of questions. I got some of them, but unfortunately we can't manage it today because uh, it was not the plan to do it uh, and you have to leave. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. And um, yeah, happy that we have the chance to, to talk to you. Yeah, thanks. And uh, well, happy to also, uh, well, if, if my boss can't, cannot make it himself, like uh, it's important for us really, seriously, as a cabinet to, to keep this dialogue uh, going. Mm -hmm. um, you are an important institution and an important uh, uh, community-led um, yeah, umbrella if for initiative. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, colleagues, a bit running out of time, but I think it was good that we had uh, the opportunity to discuss and to hear from, from Daniel um, and the point. So we move now uh, quickly to the next speaker, um, already waiting. Um, we go now to the science um, and look a bit more in details what is the science behind uh, this uh, Green Deal and the um, and the view of this transformative social um, innovation um, in this Community role, no? Let, uh, community led uh, uh, initiative. So we come now to, to Georgia Silvestri. I hope I pronounce it uh, correct. Um, ask um, Georgia whether you are online. So, yes, please press raise hand and then you should, when you then press the speak button, then we, you, you should be online. We should see and hear you. Again, raise hand. Hmm? She's also ah, okay. Don't see this. Ah, okay, Georga. So we see you Hi. and we hear you. You have the floor. Hi, thank you. Thanks a lot. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so I'm uh, Georgia Silvestri. I'm an action researcher and uh, um, also facilitator advisor at DRIF, the Dutch Research Institute for Transition. And let me also share my uh, presentation. If it works, just a moment. Okay, it's a bit slow, but I hope it's working. Okay, so I hope you can uh, now also see my yes. presentation. Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. So I'm here today from Drift, the Dutch Research Institute for Transition, and I would like to share uh, with you a bit like our, from our side, our view on transformative social innovation and also really the role and uh, that community-led uh, action uh, and community-led initiatives can really play in that just sustainability transition. So just a few words about Drift. Uh, Drift is a social enterprise based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and uh, our aim is to really uh, support, foster just sustainability transition through action research, uh, education, consultancy, and also much more uh, action, uh, action on the ground, so practice projects uh, that really lead to uh, tra uh, transformative change. And, uh, and it's difficult to explain this in a few words, but what we do is to really uh, support multi-actor collaboration, uh, especially, for example, between uh, municipality, local authorities, and also uh, initiatives on the ground, but also businesses and other actors like uh, research institute and so on, because we really believe that this uh, collaboration uh, really, uh, it's really key uh, for fostering uh, uh, transitions. And, uh, and also what we really put at the core is also the, the element of justice so that we really need uh, uh, to also really take into account uh, just 
access uh, to resources and, and, and justice for really uh, supporting uh, a transition. And, uh, and this also relates to uh, the fact that to really tackle our uh, world challenges that are so, uh, so persistent and also so connected, we cannot do it only through innovation, but we also really need a much more systemic transformative approach. And that's what we really uh, look forward. Um, so just a few words of like our kind of starting point theoretically. So we believe that transition are really uh, a fundamental change in culture, structure and practices. And this means also uh, a different ways of reorganizing a society uh, and also a much more systemic approach. So the only, let's say, uh, the, the, the use of uh, only one a solution is, is, is not the way, but we really need to uh, go through all this complexity of the systems. Um, yeah, this I already shared also that the, the fact that we really believe that justice needs to be at the core. So I'm not going to um, uh, share, uh, like, go uh, further on this. Um, but just I would like also just to share how we uh, in these uh, years uh, studied uh, the impact and also like the um, like the role of um, community led initiatives uh, all over uh, Europe and also in some cases outside of Europe. So uh, this is just an example of one of the projects that we uh, we were a part of is called Transit is already finished since quite some years. But as part of this project, we uh, analyzed uh, together with a lot, like a big consortium of partners, uh, 20 um, community led uh, initiatives that are also like translocal. So this means that they are uh, operating at the local level, but in different uh, contexts. And then they are really connected uh, at also the international level. And, uh, and this was really important for us to really getting a lot of insight on this that I will share later. But you can check Transit website to really get a full overview also of the different case studies. We study, for example, also the Global Ecovilla Network and the Transition Network and so on that are also part of Ecolis. And I also forgot to mention that Drift is one of the member of Ecoli, so we have been uh, collaborating uh, a lot uh, in, the, in the last years. And as part, uh, one of the, the, the outcome of this project is also this transition uh, of social innovation manifesto where we uh, combined, uh, we uh, tried to really summarize 13 principles for transformative social innovation. And I'm not going to mention all of them, but uh, just to, to share that um, it's really important to, uh, to create uh, the space for developing new social relations among different uh, the communities, but also other actors. And that also this trust local empowerment so this really connection between the local and the global is really important for supporting community-led action and, uh, and also that is really important to have uh, a mutual recognition, for example, between different types of actors in societies that really lead to uh, a more strategic collaboration and also change. Uh, but also, yeah, in this uh, case, I don't have a lot of time, but you can also look at this uh, online and you can check all the different principles in more in depth. Um, and just to mention, this is also important. We have been uh, working a lot with local authorities, uh, uh, so uh, in different countries. So this is an example, the Tomorrow Project, where these uh, six different cities have been developing 20 to 2050 transition roadmaps uh, in a very collaborative way with citizens. So we really the engagement of civil society. And as part of this project, we have been uh, really developing a whole approach to support local authorities on this. Uh, so to really support them to more fundamentally engage uh, civil society and also together with civil society and other actors uh, really develop visions and then actions for sustainability transitions. 
and and just a few uh, insights that I want to share with you. Uh, so as the outcome of like my uh, uh, kind of engagement in different projects at different levels, uh, it's really important to uh, again really uh, make uh, like uh, like to really put the basis of trust building between community-led initiatives and uh, municipalities and other actors. And this is really important to do it also in in countries uh, where in contexts where uh, the trust is not there and it's a really a process that takes time but it's really need to be there and also for local authorities it's really important to build capacity and also create space for uh, learning on how to engage civil society organization and also to learn from different uh, examples around Europe and the world on how to do that uh, this was also mentioned in the discussion before, like new and innovative funding mechanism also mm -hmm. for uh, community-led initiatives to not only be uh, to start, but also to be maintained. Because uh, this we see that is really a struggle uh, not to kind of start in some cases, but really to maintain activities over time so to be sustainable. So also at the European level, we need more in this sense of how to support this continuity and uh, and uh, uh, maintenance of activities. Um, and then also um, we need to support local authorities and other institutions to really uh, develop more quickly uh, governance structures and also a regulation, because what I see is that in many cases we we kind of we have a lot in th in theory or let's say in terms of plans for also what to do but it's very difficult the implementation so we really need to support more this part of the implementation because we don't have time we we really have the urgency to act now and also uh, last but not least it's very important really crucial to uh, make really an effort to make transition more just and inclusive. And this means also uh, engaging more marginalized communities and uh, people, let's say, outside uh, of the, let's say, this green bubble and trying to really engage uh, at different levels. And this also from the European level, it means also really making an effort in this sense to really finding uh, more ways, more also innovative ways to, to engage uh, that goes beyond just uh, uh, the, the usual suspect, let's say. So, yeah, sorry if I went over time yes. uh, a little bit. Uh, this is just to mention an opportunity for people that are uh, listening today. We started a new project it's called Share Green Deal, and we are uh, supporting uh, different uh, trans we call them transition experiments so uh, in different parts of Europe so there is now also this call for uh, for uh, different initiatives around uh, and for really creating local change uh, in relation to green, the Green Deal and you can find a lot on the, the Share Green Deal project um, uh, website. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much uh, Georgia. Uh, for your presentation from the timing um, was fine. I do not lose time. I directly go to the next presentation, uh, Ecolysis Policy pos punish, uh, Positioning. It's uh, Nina and Amelie. They are on site. I uh, don't know who wants to start. Yeah. Nina starts. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So um, actually, we're here today to um, present to you 10 theses on transformative uh, community-led local development policies because at Ecolis, what we want to do is really connect uh, community-led initiatives and the European level, because we see the European Green Deal as something potentially uh, for, uh, holding transformative change and something which was meant, I think, as a systemic change, which is very much in line with what community-led initiatives do and want. So our uh, goal here at Ecolise is basically to connect, um, I don't want to say top down, bottom up, because to us it's a tree, so um, it's just getting the, uh, the juices flowing and rising and uh, connecting. And if you go one slide uh, forwards, you will see um, 
10 theses are 10 questions, and we extend these 10 questions to policy makers and change makers on policy levels today for the first time. We've spent uh, six months on working on these um, 10 theses together with partners and members, and you've seen the partners, there are more than 17 partners supporting this process and this event. Um, and we devote these 10 questions to transformative community-led local development policies. So each of these words finds an answer, hopefully, an, or an exploration in these 10 theses. Why are we doing this? Because we uh, sense there is a takeoff moment, and this is a theory of change that you see here. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so we think that the transformative social innovation that Georgia uh, Silvestri of Drift has talked about is really something that community-led initiatives as laboratories for transformative change can make happen. And we see change happening, what um, the scientist here calls regime level, so that's the European Green Deal. So there is a lot in movement, and we think now is the time really to connect the change makers on all levels. And that's where I hand over yes. to Amelie. <laughs> yes, so I will just um, give you a short overview of the process that we conducted over the last month. So we started developing the policy position by reviewing existing equities publications and also engaging with our members and partners in conversations. And then we developed this uh, framework of 10 theses towards transformative community-led local development policies. And then we presented and discussed those uh, in several public events. Uh, which you can see in the next slide. Uh, we started with those events in September. They went on until November, and they were very rich discussions on, on the content of the thesis, and we, we received a lot of feedback in that context. And we also conducted um, some thematic meetings that were devoted to key areas of the policy position. And moreover, we also participated in the European Rural Parliament and uh, discussed the thesis there, but also had a conversation cafe where we uh, more generally talked about the localization of the European Green Deal. Overall, there were around 100 individuals participating in this process from roughly 50 different organizations. And um, we are really happy that there was such a great interest in this position and this is clearly a reflection of both the urgency to actually come up with ambitious action in Europe on the climate and environmental crisis and of course also of the crucial role that community-led initiatives can play in this regard. So. Um, that's why we appreciate that we are also going to continue this conversation today. The process is still ongoing. We are not finished with integrating all of the feedback that we have received so far. The consultation is also going to continue until uh, the next General Assembly of Ecolis taking place in the spring of 2023. And uh, yeah, we are really uh, happy to be with you here and uh, continue our consultation. Yeah, thank you, Nina and um, Amelie, for this really precise and short presentation. And we move now to Tom Hanfrey. Uh, Tom is a researcher and, um, and writer. And Tom, you are one of the co-founders uh, of, of Ecolise. And you give us a couple of ideas on the, on the policy. So, Tom, if you're going to raise hand and press after then the speak button, you should be online. So let's now press the speak button and we see, oh, we see you. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, I've had some peripheral involvement in this process, which really I've seen as a, an opportunity to reflect on the trajectory that we've been on for the past 10 years since I personally first got involved in the conversations that led to the establishment of Ecolisa, which for me were around the Transition Network Conference that took place in London in 2012. And at that time, there was an increase in recognition from both sides of the need for active engagement between community initiatives and policy 
the recognition that Peter and Daniel in their introductions talked about from the policy side, that there was a real need for engagement with the action of community initiatives to help achieve the environmental and social goals of policy. And at the same time, many of us in the, the field of community action recognise that in order to make significant contributions to the type of systemic transformation that Georgia Silvestri just talked about, then there was a real need to actively engage and work with policymakers to help shape the landscape in which we are operating. And that was a key driver behind the establishment of Ecolisa a couple of years later as a shared platform to support that dialogue between community initiatives and policy, particularly at European level. At that time, a key barrier to that dialogue was the lack of a suitable evidence base to inform policy. There was very little good quality research on community initiatives. A lot of key aspects were very poorly understood. There's now much more information uh, about through projects like Transit, but again, Georgia mentioned the test research project around the same time was another important land landmark. And we compiled much of this new information in our first Ecolisa status report in 2019, which was an important reference point for, um, for the, uh, for the 10 theses we're talking about now. More recently, community initiatives have moved from being simply the objects of study by researchers to becoming full partners in Horizon Action. So Ecolisa, Gen Europe, Cultivate and Ecolisa member from Ireland, the Permaculture Association of Britain, among others, have been, um, through their full involvement in these projects, have become active co-creators of their own knowledge base and started to have an input into shaping future research agendas. What's growing now is that policy engagement itself is becoming a field of research and learning. Sorry, sorry, so, Tom. Uh, the Tom. Euro Regen project at uh, uh, IST, uh, Lisbon University Institute. Tom, we have a very Adam bad... Rebrecht, as here. Tom, we have a very bad uh, sound because uh, our interpreters are not able to to interpret any longer. So if you could um, wrap up, perhaps, because otherwise we do not have interpretation into English and, and Spanish, uh, uh, because we are not able now to, to, to improve the sound now. You got it? Okay, I see you. Yeah, yeah so a message for online people that hear me well, at least. And um, uh, yeah, I just want to, to finish up by saying that the... The active involvement of academic researchers in the policy position and process that Nina mentioned is uh, another important development in that. And the next real step and the, the invitation that this event seems to offer is for policymakers themselves to become part of these learning processes. It, not uh, What are the questions that need to be asked in order to come up with the type of innovative experiments that are necessary for the Green Deal to achieve its goals? Thank you very much, uh, Tom. And sorry that we have these problems here, but uh, it's uh, not easy then to, to follow and especially to interpret then in the end. But we got the message. Uh, at least um, the English speaking one and uh, um, thanks a lot for your contribution. I directly hand over uh, to you Nina and sorry that I could manage this all in time um, bad manager I'm German so I'm not able to manage uh, exactly the timing uh, sorry for this um Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for, for having done uh, such a great job. Um, and now um, you can see that we're, we want to focus really on these 10 theses. Um, and basically, if you go to the next slide, then you'll see um, there are 10 of them. And what I like personally most about them is the transformative part. So you will see um, thesis number one uh, is about what is transformation 
transformational change. And the IPCC actually said that um, we need radical behavior change and we need a radical social change. And I mean, the IPCC is a very conservative body of over 2,000 scientists. So if they say we need a radical behavior change and radical social change, that means something. The IPCC also said that this could um, uh, save emissions of up to 70%. So if we have behavior change happening on a radical scale, this is why collective action and community-led action is so important. And we want to basically trigger conversations about these theses. And today, um, in, the, in the focus is why is collective action so important? Because policies very often, like the European Climate Pact, focuses on individual action, but not on collective action. But also, what does that mean, living a good life beyond um, economic growth? Because I think, personally, uh, you don't need growth. Like, I don't get fatter every year. That's very, very nice for myself. <laughs> so, which values and regenerative cultures do community-led initiatives bring to transformative change? And also what Georgia Silvestri talked about, the transformative social change. So what is that? And there is something which a lot of community-led initiatives do. It's called systems approach, so systems thinking. And the European Green Deal has this in its, in its origins, in its DNA. So um, it's a systemic approach. And why do community-led initiatives need public support networks? The answer is short, because there is not much support now. Um, which is why I would like to also to illustrate these theses, because community-led initiatives like permaculture, transition network, eco-villages, they have that in common that you actually need to be there and experience that in, in, uh, in real, so it's very hard to talk about them, which is why I would like to give the floor now if Ad Flems of Ecodop Bökel is in, in the audience to raise the hand and press the present button. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Art. Ah, okay, great. I'm going to click on the present button. Yes, share. Okay. This is the land we bought and we built a Bukal Ica village on. It was um, owned by a farmer who only did uh, food production as the only ecosystem service on it. When sunlight uh, hit the bare soil, the heat builds up, and when it rained, uh, moisture got lost in evaporation, and plants were uh, had difficulties, so they needed a lot of water. And when it rained uh, extreme, then the topsoil uh, washed down. So this is not a very good way to live. Um, Bukalik Village wants to be an inspiring example of sustainable living. We uh, applied for a grant uh, at the EU and uh, all 24 projects that applied for that grant uh, were put in order of potential impact and we were number one. And um, that is mostly because we have a heating system with uh, that is very uh, innovative. We have 600 solar panels that are not connected to the grid, but they uh, put all their energy into a big storage unit filled with steel waste that heats up in the summertime to 450 degrees and there's two meters of insulation on all sides to keep that heat for the rest of the year inside and when we need them in uh, autumn, winter and spring uh, to heat our houses we just uh, take the heat out. Uh, we haven't ever built anything but our houses got three sustainable building awards and we got to speak at, uh, at symposia on builders. So, uh, and we even uh, were second place in uh, a Dutch governmental award. Here are all the um, eco-village uh, system, the, uh, the ecosystem services that we use in our eco-village. So a lot more than what the farmer did. Uh, this is where we grow our food. It's uh, climate positive because in the food forest, uh, a lot of CO2 is stored in the trees and in the shrubs. 
and also into the soil. It's also resilient to pests, to all kinds of weather extremes, because it's polyculture, hundreds of different crops that all uh, can, uh, that some can withstand uh, heavy rains and other can withstand, withstand long drought. It's also good for pollinators, so it, uh, it helps them too, because uh, there are flowers all through the year. And also, uh, if you have hundreds of plants, you have thousands of different um, insects. So that also helps the decline of biodiversity. This is where we were going to build our houses. We also have a biodiversity plan for uh, the place where the houses are built. And uh, we, we protect two wild bee species, two butterfly species, two bat species, two bird species and two miscellaneous species. And we uh, have uh, asked experts from uh, uh, outside how many individuals there could be after 10 years. And so now we have a measurable biodiversity plan and each two years an expert comes, an ecologist comes and gives us pointers if we are uh, lagging in one uh, piece. The province of Brabant was so enthusiastic about our biodiversity plan, they are going to make us a part of the Dutch nature conservation area, which means we have proven that humans can have a positive impact on their natural surroundings. Our water is stored in, uh, in um, tanks, in water tanks, and then we use them in the toilets and in, uh, for the washing machines. The rest of the water in the house is just from the water company. All our wastewater is stored uh, on premises and then filtered through a constructed wetland. And then it infiltrates into the soil, which means that uh, even when long drought, thousands of liters of water go into the soil every day. Well, ecovillages have proven to have many solutions per global goal. For instance, uh, permaculture and uh, climate resilient food production, as I talked about. And uh, we want to gather all these practical solutions and um, in the Global Goals community, a digital platform in which we are going to translate it in all 24 EU languages. And we also want to uh, teach everyone uh, in the neighborhood how to do that uh, also in a knowledge and education center. And here you can see all the people who work every day to make uh, this a better place for human and nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ad. <laughs> that was really impressive. Um, and um, we're going to have another good practice example now from David Delzar, that's Transition Town, France. And um, he will present uh, a project which is about public sector support, and it's call, called Boost Eco Citoyen from France. So, David, if you're in the room, please raise your hand and press the present button. Okay, we're having problems. Just raising speak. Press the speak button. Ah, David, can you press the speak button again? Okay, let's move to the next or so. Okay. And we could try it again. No. Ah, nice. Very good. Am I online? Yes, you are. All right. So um, I'm very happy to present you today a program that is still running, uh, ending uh, at, this, at the end of this year. This program has been incubated, uh, financed, and uh, designed by different organizations, citizen-led organization, and a public agency, which is called ADEM. It's a French official agency for ecological transition. So I won't go into details how we did that. We had one year of preparation and then three years of implementation. And the program is about uh, supporting 
local citizen initiatives uh, in order to accelerate the ecological transition on the ground, the subject of today, with communities. So um, I now go to the next slide. Uh -huh. Get it. So the stakeholders involved are here. So you have five organizations. Uh, I won't go into details now, but uh, so as I mentioned, the ADEM is one of them. And so the starting uh, position of this program was that the ecological transition is not fast enough. It won't surprise anyone here. And that the citizens are on the other side uh, becoming more and more involved and developing initiative on the ground quite a lot, actually. And the vision uh, that we had, which is a classical vision for transition or citizen-based citizen transition is to develop resilient territories in, uh, in autonome and economic ecosystemic ways. And the mission of the program was to encourage uh, the citizens initiative or to develop new ones. And uh, also very important here in the discussion is to create some synergies between the citizen led initiative and other stakeholders, especially at the local level and regional one with politics. Uh, so we had five uh, areas of experimentation, which are in and around Paris. So uh, you will have the slides. So if you want to see more, you will find online more on that. There is also a website. So uh, the implementation was over three years uh, with five territories. And I give you some insight very shortly about the uh, structure. So what we did is that we um, uh, recruited two persons that um, were in, deployed on the, in, the, in these experimental areas, so-called transition project manager that, that were really based locally and supporting uh, local initiative, but also uh, simple citizen who wanted to start an experimentation. So these two uh, transition managers had uh, host structures, uh, which are part of the um, organization that are in the governance of the project, who developed this project with Adam. And we had uh, a steering committee to uh, develop um, the strategical uh, orientations on the, uh, with uh, based on the feedbacks on the ground. So we had many uh, issues to uh, deal with, but also a supervision committee where uh, the two uh, transition manager could uh, express their thoughts, give us feedbacks and got some help to uh, manage uh, quite complex subjects and also doing reporting. So uh, as I said before, it was one year of uh, preparation and three years of implementation. I couldn't um, translate this in English, but it doesn't matter. So you have it after. And then um, I will just now give you some concrete example of all these things uh, were developed and implemented with uh, case studies. Because over the course of th three years, we, through this program could help about 200 projects to uh, develop or to accelerate, all uh, local based. So the first example is uh, at, uh, is in Paris. So here is it is interesting because um, citizen-led uh, initiatives are very often a collective of citizens, but you have also many citizens, uh, especially in France, but uh, in other parts of Europe too, of course, who are very concerned about the ongoing uh, development with climate change and they really would like to engage, but they don't know how. So what we did is we supported a kind of coaching of person at the personal level and then uh, help them to define what they wanted to do, why in relation to themselves also, to their own experience in a holistic way, and then to connect them with uh, initiative uh, on collective that were already existing 
to just uh, be able to engage not alone, or in some cases to help them to develop their own projects and narratives, I would say, personal narratives. So the second uh, example is in another place, you see en Brie, uh, which has a local initiative, transition initiative, you see en Brie in transition. And here we uh, helped the citizen and this initiative to develop new uh, workshops and working group, but also to uh, to uh, foster what was already uh, happening with uh, new tools, a better governance and better organization. And uh, so it was deployed on many subjects within one year. Yeah, it's also interesting, still, uh, again, uh, in um, Paris, uh, some citizens made a mapping of what was already going on in the in their arrondissement and made a map. So it was, of course, a very good uh, opportunity for all the citizens to link themselves to other citizens and um, discover other projects around and then to build up a better ecosystem of factors locally. But also this was connected to the city hall of the 18 arrondissement. So uh, it was also a way of fostering um, networking with different stakeholders. Yeah, it's interesting also, we spoke a lot about policies um, before. And here, um, Transition France is part of a collective of organization, uh, collectif citoyen pour la transition citoyenne, which is now part of Ecolise. And they have developed, based on local experiences, a plaidoyer that was uh, developed before the local um, elections. And so citizens could organize themselves and develop a plaidoyer for the transition and to challenge all the uh, candidates and uh, move them to engage in, uh, in diff on different points um, and uh, in their program. And then uh, they could do the follow-up, this, uh, this group of citizens, just uh, making sure that the candidates who were at the city hall who, who won the elections will really implement this plaidoyer. And so uh, we help them there to organize discussion with different stakeholders because it was becoming a bit more complex. As it was mentioned earlier today, uh, they are like in France very often, sometimes some not really synergic relationship between um, mayor and uh, local groups. There is a phenomenon of concurrence and misunderstanding and a general lack of training, I would say, for the local politics about how to deal with yeah. these things. So, Sorry. I think... Yeah. Da David, we have to uh, go on. Um, and I think this would be uh, one of the great points to make a connection to the next speaker because we're running very late, David. But do you want okay, to... So just, yeah. Just want to close with the very important information here is that this is, has been also... Uh, finance with uh, public uh, money and that the engagement of the public agency. So that was very exciting part of the of the work in the in the background. Thanks a lot uh, to David Delsa for this presentation. Um, and I think the what what David mentioned so that there is a lack of social imagination what could we actually do in our community for climate and environment is something that Davy Philip of Cultivate the Sustainable Ireland Cooperative can probably empathize with and Davy Philip if you're in the room please raise your hand and press the speaker button now Davy, um, hi Davy, will introduce us to Community Climate Coaches Project. Davy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Am I sharing my own slides or are you going to switch slides there? Wh whichever you like best. Okay, let me see if I can quickly present. I know that we are over time. Uh, I'm Davy Phillip and I am going to be presenting on community led local development or community climate action through community led local development. Can you see those slides okay? Yes, we can see them, thanks.
So very quickly, well, I'm Davy Phillip. I'm based in rural Ireland. I work for Cultivate, the Sustainable Ireland Cooperative, uh, and we're based in Clock Jordan Eco Village. Um, and currently, I'm coordinating a community climate coach Erasmus project. I'm going to introduce uh, very quickly three projects that work with uh, local development companies and local authorities, but mostly local development companies. The first one is Communities for Climate Action. Uh, so in 1919, uh, 2019, we, we started as a consortium of community-led initiatives, uh, uh, training and uh, uh, sustainability training consultancy in the Eco Village, as well as our cooperative. Uh, we um, won a bid for County Kildare to develop and deliver a, a course that would help citizens understand uh, climate change and able to draw down the funding that was not being spent, that was prioritised around uh, environmental um, priorities. So really our ob objective was to build capacity, uh, increase ambition and inspire local communities to, um, to, to take action. So that programme has been done now with three other local development companies, so that's three other regions in Ireland. Uh, we've run it five times now. Um, and as well, I, I think it's building um, a response together. So it's taking action together is really the highlight or the focus of our project. Communities for Climate Action has a Google Classroom where we share all sorts of resources. We do a full day introduction. We've tried to use celebrity endorsement in a positive way. Uh, this is Duncan Stewart, a TV celebrity here, but he helped us launch in a town hall, hall meeting. And there's six modules that really start with understanding the context we're in, the limits, climate, and community climate action. Then community resilience, how do we do more together, cooperatively? How and what sort of projects might we do locally? And uh, really then focusing on energy, and mobility, uh, reducing energy demand, uh, water and climate change, zero waste in the circular economy, and local food and sustainable land use. The, the participants come to Clock Jordan Eco Village, which is where we're based, and do a full day where they can see other community-led initiatives that have got maybe leader funding uh, and be inspired, as well as working on the day of what they might do in their county. Um, so I'm going the wrong way. That project uh, was going on at the same time we were working with a bunch of uh, Ecolease members, uh, you can see them there on a Erasmus funded project to look at community led uh, facilitation for community led climate action. Uh, and we have uh, brought together, we've still got another six months until we finish, but we're really building uh, a system of training and support to enable community facilitators, mentors, animators across Europe to coach communities in taking action to build local climate resilience. So this really, again, is competency building. Uh, we, we are trying to take a, we are taking a bioregional approach uh, and ensuring that communities are empowered and supported to make the changes required uh, to meet the European Green Deal to European um, targets and national targets. That project has led to a project we're starting next year that was um, put forward to the government uh, for a large project, a large bit of funding to look at localizing this idea that's been developed by the Ecolease partners. And we call it local climate coaches. And that's done with two local development companies and our public participation network as partners. And that project then is really, again, um, bringing the skills and insights from that Ecolease movement of the the community-led initiatives that for decades have been working away at the margins to really try and mainstream and normalize a lot of these ideas uh, that can be then used by community catalysts, professionals, in local authorities, in local development companies to increase the ambition to reduce emissions and build local resilience in the face of climate and ecological um, breakdown. So we're seeing this opportunity. I'm going to leave it there uh, for if we're going to take community climate action, we'll need good facilitation, 
We need to think systemically, we need to think locally, and we need to link uh, across our regions and across Europe. I'll leave it there. There's a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Davy. This, um, this links very well because what uh, we also have in the 10 theses, and there will be breakout rooms and an interactive sessions where you can get in a discussion with policy makers and with community-led initiatives. So basically, we need a different funding for different sorts of things. Capacity uh, building, network building, healthy networks is a value in itself. And also what Davy mentioned, the bioregional approach is something that we put forward in the 10 theses a lot. And I'm very happy to have Isabel Carlyle of the Bioregional Learning Center UK. Uh, Isabel, if you're in the room, please raise your hand and press the speak button, telling about us about what is a bioregional approach. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm hoping that my connection holds well. Is there an echo on mm. my speech? Is no. it okay? It's okay. Okay, fantastic. And you're going to run the slides for me. So if we can go to the first slide. I Maybe the next slide even. So um, hopefully the slides are going to be coming up in a minute. Is it possible to get the slides up? Yeah, wonderful. If we can hold on that slide, that's wonderful. Thank you. So I'm speaking to you from South Devon, from Totnes. I, it's, I'm really delighted to be part of this conversation um, that you've reached out across the channel. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. So I think many of you know um, the context in which we're exploring all these issues, the context of planetary boundaries and tipping points. I This is the most recent analysis from Stockholm Resilience Center of the planetary boundaries that have been breached. And we here in South Devon, in the South Devon bioregion, work closely with the Global Systems Institute at Exeter University, uh, led by Professor Tim Lenton, who's one of the IPCC authors, and who has carved out a name for himself by working not just on climate tipping points, but also social tipping points. So social tipping points are ways in which we can um, adapt, essentially, uh, to the situation we now find ourselves in. Next slide, please. So what is a bioregion? I'll, I'll read this out for the benefit of the, uh, the translation. And this is a, a definition that we've created here in South Devon. A bioregion invites us to inhabit a place in a way that is full of relationship. Seeing where the natural boundaries of our bioregion are, we can then see the many ecosystems and human systems alive within it. All of these systems, like fresh water and biodiversity, or transport and health, or economies and ecologies, are connected. There is also a connecting story that starts in deep geological time, shows up in the landscape and soil, and then in human culture. Bioregioning is the collective practice of bringing vitality to these connections angling the systems towards regeneration and taking actions for a climate resilient and biodiverse future. So if we could have the next slide. So how big is here? How big is your bioregion? Why have we decided to work at bioregional scale? Well, if we're working at adapting to huge geosystems on the move, finding ways in which our human systems can in a sense, kind of measure up to the enormous forces for change that we are seeing unfold around us. It's best to do that, we think, at a scale that is also systemic, but a scale that makes human sense. And humans and prehumans, if you call Neanderthals prehumans, have functioned in bioregions for millennia. It's a scale that makes absolute sense. It's a fantastic scale for human organizing. You can drive across our bioregion in half a day so you can have face-to-face -face meetings and be home in time for lunch or for dinner. And it's also a scale at which there is a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of we share this culture. And it's also a scale at which we can, um, in a sense, transcend political boundaries. Why do we want to do that? We want to do that because we want to give people a sense of spaciousness and freedom and the freedom to experiment. That doesn't mean we don't work with our municipalities and 
local governance, because we do, but we really wanted to find a scale that made ecological sense to us. So you can see uh, in the two maps, uh, the map on the left is our South Devon bioregion. It has many rivers in it. It's defined by water. It's defined by two rivers, east and west, where they rise on Dartmoor in the north and the sea in the south. And if you go across to the map on the right-hand side, I don't know if you can see my, you won't be able to see my cursor, I don't think, but we're the bulge just below where it says Devon. And our bioregion includes rural areas, a lot of rural areas, but also two urban areas, Plymouth and Tynmouth. If we could move on. Thank you. So bioregions are not neutral spaces. I mean, some of you will have heard of bioregions because of the work that was done in the northwest Pacific coast of the USA back in the 60s and 70s by um, Planet Drum, for instance, by Peter Berg, and, and so on. But in a sense, there's been an enormous regeneration or resurgence of bioregions. And earlier this autumn and the end of October and beginning of November, a bunch of us ran uh, an international online conference for two weeks on bioregional regeneration. And clearly this is a, an idea whose time has come. Bioregions from the sacred headwaters of the Amazon to Costa Rica, from India to the, um, to Iceland are all work, starting to work at bioregional scale. And the space is not neutral because it collects many ideas. Many ideas that are being shared in this conference today come together in bioregions. And certainly co-design with civil society is a big part of what we do. We put that absolutely central to what we do here in South Devon. And because, perhaps because transition networks started here, um, in Totnes, perhaps because of that, we already have so many projects going on that we as the Bioregional Learning Center don't have to work on projects themselves. We act as the glue. We act as the bridging between municipalities and civil society, between academia and between communities. And we bring many different sectors together. Next slide, please. So one of the things we've been doing is looking at the friction points between human systems and geosystems. And a lot of our work started with water. In fact, we started with water about 10 years ago. And this is the drinking water map for South Devon. Um, interestingly, Southwest Water uh, only this year became comfortable at releasing a map which actually had geographical names on it. Before that, they didn't want to share where the different um, water purification stations were and where the pipelines were. But anyway, this is our drinking water map for South Devon. Um, South Devon was enormously stressed this past summer in terms of drinking water. Most of our drinking water comes out of reservoirs and rivers because our geology doesn't allow um, storage of water in rocks beneath the soil. And the most recent project we did was to get communities on our local river to look at the impact of climate change on freshwater supply. And we shared this map with them. Next slide, please. So um, this is a very, uh, five minutes probably isn't long enough to unpack everything I want to say, but the organizers of this um, small conference have asked me to also to share what we've done on the Devon Donut. So the Bioregional Learning Center has been in existence for about six years. And about um, two and a half years ago, there was an event here in Devon online called Regenerate Devon. And Kate Rayworth, who, as you know, was the originator of Donut Economics, that whole concept as to how we could analyze our places, both economically and ecologically at the same time, sent a short video. And as a response to that, we'd never seen a chat window go on fire in the way that it did. And we were inspired by that to form a collective to create a people's donut for Devon. And this is a project we worked on all last year with um, fortnightly meetings that every two weeks, um, the collective met up on Zoom and we delved into what are called these different domains. So each segment of the donut is a different domain. On the outside, you've got roughly the Stockholm Resilience Center's planetary boundaries. And on the inside, you've got the sustainable development goals from the United Nations and the social foundation beneath which we do not want to slide. Next slide, please. So in Devon, we contextualized everything. We contextualized the domains. We decided, for instance, that ocean acidification didn't really mean a lot to people in Devon. So we called it coastal marine health. And for each of these different segments or sectors of the donut, 
we held sessions in which we invited experts who were working on the ground in that sector to come and tell us what they saw to be the most significant scenario playing out in that sector. That if we could shift the needle on that scenario would give us the handle on shifting that whole sector. And here you will see in the slide the beginning of our thinking around how to contextualize indicators and thresholds for each sector. And let me just give you a little example. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the number of fishing vessels out of Devon's harbors bottom trawling days per year. And we zoomed in on that for coastal marine health because Brixham is the premier fishing port in the whole of England. And millions of pounds worth of fish go through it. But we also had learned in 2021 through a paper that was published in Nature that bottom trawling emits as much carbon dioxide per annum as global aviation. So we thought if we could stop the fishing vessels bottom trawling, we might be able to prevent so much carbon dioxide being emitted. But we got the harbour master from Brixham Harbour to come and talk to us and said, you can't do that. If you do that, you're going to alienate, alienate the fishermen. It's much better to concentrate on highly protected marine areas. Next slide, please. Um, Isabel, I think we so have to... So these are our twin Isabel, indicators, sorry. which are paths for citizens and policymakers to take action on these different sectors, on these different pathways to action. Isabel? Sorry, yes. Sorry, we would need to um, uh, wind this up. I'm sorry for this. We, you have four, five minutes. Maybe you can add what you wanted to say and come to Thank an you. end. Thank yes, you. Yes, maybe just one more slide and then we'll... We'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. There's a lot to say. I, yes. Yeah, so the way we work is with citizens and it's led innovation on one hand and policy change on the other. And our role as the bioregional learning center is to bridge the two. Next slide. Um, so this is I like the last scale of the last slide. Um, we're working with, um, extra university and Devon and Cornwall. Um, councils in order to create climate adaptation hubs at bioregional scale. So um, this is where I'm going to stop my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, this, I think, shows very well how different the ideas are and the um, the skills needed to really have an answer to the planetary crisis in place. And uh, it leads over these four good practice examples are all linked to the 10 theses in one way or the other. And this leads to the next round uh, where we have uh, policy change makers with us. And I'm welcoming Benoit Bito here, who is actually a member of the European Parliament, a vice chair of the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Dev Development. And um, Benoit, you've listened to these good practice uh, examples and agriculture is one of the biggest budget um, expenses of the EU, about, above 30%. And within this budget, there is something which also helps rural development. So the leader community-led local development approach. Um, how do you think could we use this instrument, which is one of the few which translates ch uh, channels, funds and policies to local levels to implement the European Green Deal? Oui, d'abord. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'll just give you a moment to put your headphones on so that you can listen to the interpretation. Uh, I speak English, but not very well, so I'd rather speak my mother tongue, if you don't mind. So, yes, I'm an MEP. I'm the first vice president of the Agri and Rural, Deve and rural Development Committee, and I'm also a farmer myself. I come from the rural world. That's my profession. And I think I'm entitled to talk about such subjects. Now, before I was an MEP, I was the vice president of the poitou Charente region of France, where the president is better known than poitou Charente. Our president was Ségolène Royal. I think everybody's heard of Ségolène Royal. I was the vice president of that region, and I was in charge of rural development matters. 
at the time when in 2014 in France it was decided to give more power to the regions with regards to the use of European funds. These were regions who became management authorities for the second pillar of the common agricultural policy. These funds are there to accompany the agricultural transition but also rural development policies. And bear in mind that the CAP policy, which represents a third of the EU budget, is often identified as the policy to support agriculture. But through this second pillar, the funds there are used for rural development. And this is an important aspect of the CAP. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. In 2014, when we were trying out this idea of having the regions managing these funds for the ecological transition and rural development, the first observation we can make is that even if we're full of good intentions, most of the assistance of the CAP is actually direct assistance of the first pillar, which represents 80% of the budget and with the best will in the world. And with all the ingenuity in the world, whether we're talking about uh, rural tran transitions or changing tra um, agricultural policies, given that 80% of the budget had already been used up by direct aid in order to provide sustenance to an agricultural system that was required to provide almost no conditionality, and I mean, it's a terrible uh, statement to make. Most of the cap money goes to farms and farmers that use pesticides, they use synthetic um, chemicals which do the worst harm to biodiversity and the harm of those who eat the food. Now at the European level, a hundred billion of the cap over seven years was supposed to be sent to resilient, climate resilient agriculture. The opinion of the audit committee has been um, definite that this money has not gone to the um, areas it was supposed to go to. So that's the first um, crack in this logic. Now let's talk about the new common agricultural policy. This, what, what we want to do and what I hope we're going to do is is give less weight to the premier, um, to the first pillar. And if we can't give less weight to it, then at least increase the conditionality and make that much more severe. So that in the, in the first pillar, there is a real agricultural transition. I'm not trying to interfere with farming. But what we have to tell farmers is if you want to continue to use pesticides, if you want to continue to use synthetic um, fertilizers, if you want to continue to raise animals in unacceptable conditions, then that's your business choice. But we, the lawmakers, the, the guarantors of public policies, we will not support that agriculture. We would rather support agriculture that is in line with the agricultural transition, the ecological transition, and which thinks about the health of the planet and the health of consumers. So if all of the finance is oriented towards this transition, then there's no limit. There's no reason why farmers shouldn't adhere to this um, philosophy of transition and particularly in France as I said the regions manage this fund and so the companies the agricultural businesses that survive the best in a situation of crisis are those agricultural structures that have opted for this environmental transition so it is a virtual circle a virtuous circle sorry now if we look at rural development our good experience comes from the fact that we were able to give a lot of support to local action groups and we saw projects emerge that resemble the projects that you've presented throughout the, this, this meeting. And they've come to fruition because f public funds managed by public authorities have been able to drive forward these projects. So for us at least, or for me, and for 
a number of people like me, these would be the direction that we would like to see taken. The new um, cap will be put in place in, in January 2023 and the, it should be oriented the way we've... But unfortunately, it's not doing what I would like it to do. The The first pillar remains still um, the most important with little conditionality. The second pillar doesn't have enough capacity to reverse... Um, to reverse the situation, and now the uh, the the icing on the cake here is that we've actually taken a step back from this idea of local management, where we could have regional management or even public intercommune um, authorities managing the funds. We've now we're moving towards a renationalisation of the cap. Now we're giving less force to the idea of this word common in the common agricultural policy. So it's a much more national um, approach. And we've also, at the regional level at least, we've reduced the power of the regions, at least in France, and we've re-centralised these, these public funds at a national level and a much more centralised state level. And so in this is this is not the approach which will encourage more local initiatives. And it has made that the, the, the situation has become a much more nationalised picture. And so well, I don't want to depress anybody, but although there is still some um, room for manoeuvre, the French, the French uh, president, prime, uh, prime Minister said that the, the road ahead is clear, but it's a steep hill to climb. Thank you. Noir for these clear words. Um, I think that's a bit about uh, the big white elephants within the European Green Deal, which might well have had a systemic intention, maybe still has. Also, we heard Daniel Mees here of the Cabinet of Franz Timmermans this morning. But uh, at Ecolis, our 10 theses are really there to uh, create conversations about topics like agriculture and the common agricultural policy, which used to be conversations amongst experts. And I heard Franz Timmermans once say that these conversations really need to happen amongst citizens because it's the biggest budget uh, of the European Union and it is public uh, taxpayers' budget. So which uh, is why I would like to ask our uh, policy uh, a speaker here, Laurence Graff of DG Klima. If Laurence is in the room, then please raise your hand and uh, pr press, the, press the speak button. Laurence, uh, you are an advisor for the uh, Director General DG Klima of the European Commission, and the European Commission has a European Climate Pact. So the Commission knows very well that um, to achieve implementation of the Green Deal, um, Europe needs to reach out to citizens. What well, we've just heard from Benoit um, makes me feel personally that this European Climate Pact needs teeth because so far it doesn't have a budget. It is a great initiative. I am a Climate Pact ambassador as well, but it does not have a budget. There are no legislatory uh, binding targets combined with it, which would say each local region needs to do this, that, and this in a holistic, systemic way. Laurence, uh, do you, can you tell us how does uh, the European Commission, that's a big question to ask, but how does the Commission want to localize this European Green Deal? Are there any plans and ideas that you can tell us of? Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me start perhaps by giving a, a bit of a, a couple of words of, of context, following up on what uh, Daniel Mess uh, uh, rightly said at the beginning. He said that we would not have had the Green Deal to start with without citizens' pressure, uh, the pressure from young people and so on, which is completely right. Now we are, you know, reaching another, another stage and a very, very important one. Because we let's assume that we will get, you know, the the final Green Deal deal, so to say, on all the proposals very soon, and it's well underway, as you've understood. 
uh, including on the Repower uh, EU initiatives, uh, what the challenge we have ahead of us now, and that's a very, very uh, important and significant challenge, is to go for implementation. So implementation so that collectively we can reach the EU goal, as well as, of course, uh, uh, the, the national goals agreed by member states. So that's, the, that's what we have ahead of us in a difficult context, as we know. So I would say that for us, uh, as a, a general point, we need everybody on board more than ever. So I'm very, very pleased to be with you and to hear there's so many uh, initiatives already out there and the, and the, the many uh, ideas as well that are coming up from, uh, from the local level which is very, very inspiring. But we need more action. We need the right enabling environment to support ambition, to support fairness as well, because we need everybody on board and some will be more impacted than, than others, but we need to look at fairness very, very crucially as well. And, and the commission is, is, is uh, fully supportive of that. As you know, and, and it's fair to start with that, uh, and I will not talk about agriculture, but generally speaking, uh, the fact is that our traditional sort of uh, uh, counterpart is the state level, the central authorities. But uh, now that we know that, you know, the Green Deal will not be achieved uh, without uh, um, local action and initiatives, I think we are also uh, very, very keen to make sure that uh, this is happening and that the, the conditions, uh, the tools are there to support that action. So that means, in essence, giving visibility and recognition to these initiatives and working with them on the right uh, enabling environment, which will, of course, differ from one member state to the other, and if I may say, from one region to the other. So we'll have to see. I think we'll have to work on the right articulation between, you know, the EU action and tools, member states, and then the, the local level. Now, in practice, uh, as you know, most of the of the money that we have and that should be used to achieve strategic polit political priorities of the EU, and needless to say, the Green Deal is a major political priority, all these, these, these funds are being channeled to member states, through member states. I'm talking about, you know, the regional policy, the cohesion funds, be it the, so the Sustainable Development Fund, the Just Transition Fund, or the newly created uh, Social Climate Fund. Um, it, there is also a lot of money coming from the recovery plans where, once again, Green Deal is being targeted. So I think this is important to keep in mind. And, and considering you know, the importance we attach to local action, the local dimension is increasingly being addressed in the governance uh, uh, sort of regulation and the discussion we are having with member states uh, in terms of governance, how the funds uh, should be uh, allocated and used uh, for each of them to comply with their respective targets. Now, um, beyond that, obviously, um, there are a number of, uh, of EU initiatives. I think Daniel Mess mentioned um, the missions. And two missions are particularly relevant for, uh, for the Green Deal. One is about cities. It's about the, the, star, the smart and, and, and climate neutral cities mission, uh, where we will do our best to facilitate um, the achievement of climate neutrality by 2030 for more than 100 city missions. And, and the other one is about adaptation. And I think that's also a point which I've, I've heard uh, this afternoon, that we need to look at emission reductions as well as adaptation, because we've come to a point where, unfortunately, we have to look into this as well. So these are already two initiatives. Now you mentioned the Climate Pact. And, uh, and, and I think the Climate Pact, which has been there from the start, uh, along with the Green Deal, has an, Im an important role to play with... Uh, other uh, EU institutions with other EU initiatives 
um, on a number of aspects. Uh, I don't think we will get, uh, you know, a budget, uh, unfortunately, by ourselves. But I think we will have to work through existing initiatives and existing policies. And I think there is a great deal to do, first of all, to stress the critical role uh, to be played by local actors in implementing the Green Deal. I don't think it's sufficiently realized. You know, the role of cities, the role of uh, rural uh, regions, uh, and so on and so forth, that needs to be, the case needs to be made uh, much more strongly. And I think the PAC has a role to play in there. To give them also uh, much more visibility and recognition, to create networks and to share good practices, you know, what works, what doesn't work, and why, uh, so that, you know, it can be shared and, and hopefully emulate uh, actions uh, by, by others. To work on transboundary, uh, you know, uh, regions as well, the Alp regions, the Alpine regions, the Mediterranean regions, I think there is a lot to share there and to do together. Um, to work on the right articulation, you know, of what can be done, uh, is there at EU level, what is there at member states level, and then the local aspects. Um, and also to work on, on citizens' engagement, possibly, because I think the pact would have a role to play in reviving, you know, the local democracy, so to say. And I think the Green Deal is certainly a very good way to engage in that, because there is a lot of appetite from citizens uh, to engage in that. So I think that's certainly a very, very good, uh, uh, you know, uh, dimension. Um, we, I think the, the, the pact will uh, engage in a new implementing phase from next year on one, onwards, and I think we will look into all of that, working also very, very closely with the Committee of the Regions, with the Economic and Social Committee in Brussels, and having much more regular exchanges with uh, organizations like Ecolis to take stock of where we stand, what the needs are, and how all together with member states we can, you know, uh, basically be responsive to these needs. So I think the, ca the, the PAC can also get into this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Laurence. Um, what you just said is basically um, uh, that uh, citizens and community-led initiatives are needed. And I will use your input to um, formulate a question towards Lydia Pavic Rogosic, who is an EESC member, and she is also a sustainable, sustainable development actor. And uh, Lydia, what we've just heard is that there is a need for citizen involvement, a need for community-led initiatives to basically implement the European Green Deal. And um, I must say that I feel a bit like, you know, there's so much on my shoulders already as a citizen, and now they put this on my shoulders. It's like my boss says, see, now you have to save the planet. Just do it in your spare time. It's going to be fine. Um, Lydia, um, if you see one way how to strengthen conversations between community-led initiatives, citizens, and um, policy stakeholders. Is there something, why would policy stakeholders talk to citizens? And I, I am going to frame this question, which is um, maybe not nice of me, but my impression is that uh, my municipality here in Wallonia speaks to me when there is a fund to, to be distributed and there is obligatory inclusion of citizens. Um, Lydia, what, what is your take? How can we strengthen conversations between local communities and policy stakeholders? Uh, thank you, Nina. Uh, yes, uh, I would like first to uh, like to state that uh, here in ESC we uh, were and we know that actually uh, uh, shift towards uh, climate resilience and uh, uh, sustainable economy is uh, started uh, and driven to a great uh, extent by bottom-up uh, approach. That's something that Lutz also uh, mentioned. 
and those initiatives are led by uh, citizens, community, local authorities, uh, consumers, and uh, some social and innovative enterprises. And what we see, what we need, I would say, is that uh, those uh, voices and uh, those initiatives has support from the uh, local, but also regional and national governments, which uh, very often is uh, not uh, the case. And also what is needed is this uh, financing that is innovative, but also sustainable, that we already mentioned it uh, before, that it's not just uh, project-oriented. We need something that it's uh, on a, a long run, and that's why we need to empower or re-empower citizens to be able to, to work on uh, positive change, but also that they have uh, um, uh, trust and that they have a feeling that uh, uh, they, are, they have been heard. Uh, not just involved in some conversation. That was also the, uh, I, I think uh, you mentioned European Rural Parliament, that was also message from the participants. Uh, we don't need the new tools, we want uh, and we need to be uh, really heard and that uh, our ideas are taken by the politicians. So actually I think we need kind of bottom-up but also combination from top-down in sense that uh, some frameworks uh, enable uh, uh, citizens' activities because, uh, as Luz mentioned, some um, uh, initiative would like to uh, start some activities uh, but uh, they are not able to because the legislation is not allowed, uh, allowing that. There is a situation, I, I'm from Croatia, and uh, once uh, even one uh, of my colleagues said uh, in regards to solar uh, uh, powers on uh, uh, on private houses. Uh, dear government, don't help us anymore. Before we needed uh, 60 permission. Now, uh, when you start to help us, we need 100 per permission. So, in a sense, it, it should be uh, really enabling uh, environment for such initiatives. And in that uh, sense, I think uh, uh, politicians, what I asked in the beginning, actually need to be sensitized that uh, they have to really heard and work with uh, with uh, uh, with local people and that uh, uh, also I think what we heard today these good examples are always uh, good to uh, to be transferred or to be inspiration. And in regards to ESC, we really try to facilitate uh, a discussion group uh, with civil society. I would like just to say circular economy stakeholder platform, uh, which is a joint initiative of uh, co our committee and European uh, Commission and really is doing well and provide platform Forum for different talks. Um, Europe, and uh, one other activity that is important for us and that uh, uh, relates to the youth. Uh, recently we adopted uh, opinion towards structured youth engagement on climate and sustainability in the EU decision-making process and based on that we uh, start um, youth uh, roundtables on different issues related to uh, climate and uh, environment and these events they we shall have the third round with Commissioner Wojciechowski uh, about sustainable food system so uh, we are uh, we try to 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 make a platform of uh, between uh, among civil society and decision uh, maker making uh, bodies on EU level uh, European climate pact was mentioned so I will not uh, go in details, but we are really involved in rural pact, which is uh, around uh, uh, long-term uh, vision for uh, EU rural uh, areas, and uh, it's uh, uh, 
uh, in the progress, work in the progress. We are talking now about governing uh, principles, governing uh, um, models, uh, and how really to engage all levels and all different uh, sectors. And uh, just one uh, thing that uh, I would like to mention that uh, uh, sometimes when it is something obligatory, like local action groups in leader approach, then somehow uh, the practice is here. Although so, uh, in some cases, uh, I would say also in Croatia, that uh, local action groups are now uh, prolong the hand of the ministries. They lost a little bit of these uh, uh, initiatives. I hope that Benoit in France is maybe different. But uh, uh, yeah, but a CLLD approach in urban areas is actually not uh, somehow uh, embedded because maybe it's not uh, obligatory, I would say. So sometimes, you know, this... Uh, uh, methods that are obligatory uh, build the practice uh, later on. So yeah. I so, hope I was not too long. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that was uh, very good to hear about the EEC's intermediary role also in bringing the voice of uh, civil society organizations such as Equalis to the European levels. And um, I have one more question to Hanna Zdanowska, mayor of Wuj. Um, Hanna Zdanowska is here as a representative of the European Committee of the Regions. And Hanna, I also would like to ask you the same question because you are mayor of Wuj, so you're a mayor of a quite large city in Poland. How can you or strengthen these conversations between policy stakeholders, uh, you are one yourself, and your citizens? Do you think something like binding targets for citizens and regions would be something that would help you to have uh, regional or bioregional development plans which and an oblig obligation to involve citizens? Would that make it easier for you as a local policy stakeholder to engage with citizens. Hanna, if you are in the room, please raise your hand and um, press speak. Thank you, Hanna. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank organizers for the invitation. Today's topic, invol involvement of inhabitants and our stakeholders in ec ecological changes, is touching on one of the crucial aspects uh, of the green transformation. Today it means more than a few years ago. We need our inhabitants not only to understand the aspect of our development policy, not only to co-create the development goals, but also to share their sources, time, money, knowledge and experience, or even lower the standard of living. Having in mind the green transformation means today additional efforts and challenges for our residents. We as policymakers have to keep our citizens in the center of all ecological processes. For that, we need official system implementing long-term commitment of local government and right of residents to be their partner. I would like to give you an example from, from Łódź. Łódź is a typical post-industrial city. Despite the big rural revitalization program so far, still needs integrate and complex action in all fields. Environmental and climate are the most crucial. A largest part of the communal building still needs revitalization. The other challenge connected with industrial history of which was a poor involvement of citizens. That is why I have started close cooperation with inhabitants from the first day of the beginning the mayor. Thanks to that, today we have kind of tradition and having dialogue and talks with inhabitants in all parts of the city, 
we use different forms, walks, walks, uh, picnics, workshops, debates. Co-create and participatory approach, it is the main priority used also in the development strategy adopted last year. Additionally, almost three years ago, we start to implement ECOPAC, kind of local climate pack, together with representatives of local business, universities and residences, in, of which we implement undertaking to improve the environmental. These projects range from greening the city, setting up the insect habitats, to clean up uh, public spaces. So far, 30 companies have decided to cooperate with the city, donating not only money, but also their time, knowledge, and own ideas. We also organize online citizens' ensemble, of which dedicated the greenery in the city. Soon we will host the next edition, this time on climate. City offers also different grant programs of greenery, social gardens, and water retention. We pay special attention to ed ecological education. We organize set of meetings on eco -innov -innov innovations, energy efficiency, and green deal, reaching different audience, youngsters, older generations, civil servants, NGOs, or business. We work on this project to improve people's climate awareness and finally to complete area revitalization of wood that covers almost 2,000 hectares. It is the only way to improve quality of life of all inhabitants in my city. Today, green change, uh, change, changes are more challenging, not only for people, but also for local authorities. We are on the front lines on many local problems and crises, but that's true. It is, it is not only related to financial sources or ability to shape regulations. As local leaders, we are responsible for implementation of many decisions that have been taken on the higher levels, particularly related to the climate, that negatively affects possibility of reaching climate goals. So in my opinion, we need effect, efficient communication, cooperation and particip participatory approach. We can achieve that by for five different solutions. Reaching out the European institution to as much local leader as possible with knowledge, especially about available funds and tools, as well as good practices. As a climate pact and content of Mayor's ambassador, I would need tools to fulfill my mission. Secondly, raising awareness and climate responsibility among our residents by efficient, clear and simple communication about current state of play, available solution and support. We need information material on Green Deal uh, and like uh, linked initiative available in all EU langu languages. And third, making stronger and multi-level cooperation, we need direct financial support to develop cooperation with business and science and find the best innovative tailor-made solution for our city. I would also recommend its uh, selection of the top best eco practices and organization of study visit for civil servants and political with EU financial support it could help us to move from the talking to action. Involving local governments in the shaping climate commitments, it is the last solution which I suggest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hanna. This was really, really inspiring and interesting. Um, and one can feel that cities are at the, as you called it, forefront. 
uh, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to visiting Wuch again. <laughs> oh, I want to invite. It will be our pleasure to. Thank you. It's many changes in the city, really. Day by day, we change. We change everything, but we want to be very sensible development and very green city. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Thank I, you very much. I think what comes across here from the presentations and the um, inputs is also that it's always about people. So people really have a crucial role. The personalities who are doing things uh, are crucial. And if we could show the slides at this point. So um, we're now at the point where we will we'll go into the breakout rooms. We are uh, running 20 to 25 minutes late, so we, are, um, we have to catch up somehow, which is why I would like to um, ask the audience, if you're interested in this process, you can contribute to this policy positioning process of Equalis. And we're now going into the discussions about specific theses in small breakout rooms with 10 to 20 people in one breakout room dedicated to one thesis. You will also get the slides and the link to these 10 theses afterwards and you can comment, so you, you can leave your comments and we're really he building here on the collective intelligence and it has worked so far. So um, get in touch if you're interested to contribute to this process and now we would ask you um, the audience, the participants, now is time for the interactive session and you should have gotten um, one email with a Zoom link to the interactive session. So I'd ask you now to go into your email account, have a look, maybe you also have a um, calendar invite with this Zoom link. So we have four different th thematic clusters, which is ecology, economy, society, and democracy and politics. So have a look in your email account if you found that, because we're going to start these breakout sessions in about, I'd say, 10 minutes. So um, I'm going to watch now how many of the people are going to disappear. We'll see you on Zoom. And um, we'll wait here a little for those who can't find their Zoom link. There is always a rescue, but please have a look first because that would make our lives simpler if you found this link. Yeah. So we will see you on Zoom. We will also uh, put the links to breakout rooms into the Interactive chat, just to make sure for those who haven't got this Zoom link ready that you get it. So, w Lukas, could you put this link into the Interactive chat to the Zoom links? Yeah, yeah. We will share QR codes now on the slides. And um, great. So hopefully see you on Zoom uh, and thank you for being with us for so long. Thank you. <laughs>